All right. Welcome to chapter four. What I'm going to do real quick since we cut out yesterday is I'm going to finish up the, we were on the last slide of chapter three. So I'm just going to finish up this last slide and then we'll move on to the next chapter. Um, so yesterday we were going through all the addendums and all of the uh, kind of the third party financing, all the financing addendums. This is the addendum for release of liability on an assumed loan and or restoration of a seller's VA entitlement. Now, if you remember the VA loans we talked about um, in seventh class is that a, VA, a veteran can only have one VA loan at a time. And so basically what this form does is it allows uh, a seller to basically be released from their previous VA loan so they can be they can get another VA loan for their income, basically. Um, so a seller can make a contract contingent upon being released from liability by the lender or being able to get their VA entitlement restored. So again, that's basically saying that the seller, who would be the veteran in this case, if they have a VA loan on their current house, when they sell it, they can make this, the contract contingent among, upon them getting released from their VA loan so they can get it, and that, that VA entitlement restored so they can get another VA loan. That's all that last one was going over. I'm going to pull up the, the form real quick. And we can look at it. So this is what that addendum for release of liability looks like. So again, it's an auto fill the address. Um, you put the address of the property in here, and then basically you have release of the seller's liability. And then if you scroll down, it'll say you kind of have the restoration of this, the entitlement for the game. So within blank days after the effective date of this contract, seller and buyer shall apply for restoration of seller's VA entitlement and shall furnish all information and documents required by VA. This is again basically saying that both the seller and buyer will apply to, they basically have to sign that the, the buyer will buy the seller's property so that way the seller, there is proof that the seller will get his VA loan back basically. There's proof that the seller has a, a right to get a new VA loan for his new house. That's all this notice is trying to say. So I just wanted to cover that since we cut out yesterday before we got to cover that slide. All right, then we'll go on into today's information. So cool, we are on chapter four, covenants, commitments, and notices. The learning objectives. Today we're gonna to identify the provisions within paragraphs four, the license holder disclosure, which is not paragraph four anymore. Uh, five, the earnest money, of the one to four family residential contract. Describe the purpose of the option money and how to correctly fill out paragraph five. It is along with the option money now, not 23. We'll fix that as we go through the, the slides today. Um, like I said, they just put a new contract, so the contracts are kind of jumbled up, but we'll I'll clarify those as we go through them. Uh, of the one to four family residential contract. We're also going to identify the provisions within paragraph six, the title policy and survey of the one to four family residential contract including the notices one to 10. There are 10 notices that come in paragraph six um, and I identify the provisions within paragraph seven, the property condition of the one to four family residential contract. All right, license holder disclosure. If you want, go ahead and cross out paragraph four and put paragraph eight. That is now part of paragraph eight. Uh, we will look through it on the contract together so I can, so I can show you where that is. Uh, again, you can ignore every time it says page whatever of the supplement we don't have a supplement. I'm just going to pull up the contracts here. So we're not going to actually have supplements to go through that way. Uh, this requires a licensee to dis disclose relationship to a party to the transaction. If you want to go ahead and pull up the zip form contract, we can scroll down to paragraph eight. So yes, like I said, it's no longer paragraph four. It is now going to be pull the zip tag. Yeah. So here we go, paragraph. Like I said, these are okay. There you go, brokers and sales agent. So brokers or sales agent disclosure. Texas law requires a real estate broker or sales agent who is a party to the transaction or acting on behalf of a spouse, parent, child, business entity in which the broker or sales agent will own more than ten percent of a trust, for which the broker or sales agent acts as a trustee or of which the broker or sales agent for the broker or sales agent, spouse, parent, child, is a beneficiary. To notify the other party in writing before entering into a contract of sale, disclosure if applicable. Now what this is basically saying, all of this is that if you're related to somebody or you're related to a company in a way that is, the, is one of the parties in the transaction. If you are 
Um, for example, if my mom was to buy a house in this blank here, I would have to put sellers, or if my mom was to buy a house, I have to put buyer's agent is the son of the buyer. You'd have to put, you'd have to disclose that relationship here. Um, when my brother bought a house, I had to put in here, buyer's agent is the brother of the buyer, basically. Um, and then also, for example, if Justin was to buy a new building for some, like for this company, he would have to put in here that uh, buyer's agent or buyer's broker owns shares in Noble's Realty Group or owns Noble's Realty Group. Or you have to disclose that information as far as it comes to a company as well. Um, so yeah, that is the move again from paragraph four to paragraph eight. So just keep that in mind for when we go through, um, you know, when you're going through the slides to make sure to cross that stuff out. The test, we, again, I did get confirmation that the tests are going to be over the new contracts as of April 15th. So they already changed. So all the time, all the tests will be over the new contract, not the old one. So just remember that. Then you go ahead. All right, so now we're going to go through. Now we're going to go through the earnest money. It's paragraph five of the wonderful family residential contract. That is still correct. It is still paragraph five. Um, the amount is a decision of the parties and it is not a required element of the contract. Now, what that is basically saying here is that, again, it is good practice and it's kind of normal practice to have it be 1% of the sales price. So a $300,000 house would have $3,000 in earnest money. That is normal practice in this situation. However, it is completely up to parties. I can, I can submit an offer that says I will pay you $1 in earnest money. You would also send that back saying, how about 1%? You can, this is a negotiable part. Anything in a contract that has a blank in it is actually a negotiable part of the contract. So this amount is a decision of the parties. Again, you can kind of choose that. It is also not a required element. You can just put zero in there. So you can also just put zero as the earnest money if you didn't want to put up some. Um, but it does show serious intent of the buyer and acts as liquidated damages in the event of a default. Now, what this is basically saying is that the reason earnest money is, it shows serious intent is that if anything happens, if the buyer goes past their option period and then decides to back out, that money goes to the seller. So that is a situation, that's why it shows serious intent is you're basically proving that by putting up this much money, I am showing you that I do not want to leave this transaction because if I leave out of my option period, you will get the money. So I lose out on that money altogether. Um, so again, that's why it's often negotiated. It's usually 1% of the sales price, but I have seen some that they, like I think in, maybe in Austin, I want to say in Austin or in Houston, they usually, like normal is 2%, not 1%. So that's just how that works. Um, but again, it is negotiable. You can put in whatever, they can counter with whatever, you're allowed to go back and forth and negotiate that. Um, I will like, so for an example for this, I'm actually not thinking about it. My brother, when he bought his house, um, we put up 1% for earnest money. His house was 300,000. We put 3,000 down for earnest money. Well, then they came back and had, had us change our closing date to be sooner. Well, because it was gonna be sooner, we weren't sure if we were gonna get all the stuff, all our due diligence done to make sure the house was what we fully wanted. So we wanted to lower the price. And so what we did is we cut out $10,000 on the price, but we upped our earnest money from 3,000 to 6,000 to prove that we were still serious. Now this is a situation where like, again, we double our earnest money, that money goes towards closing costs. So overall, you're not losing out on any money by putting up more money now. But what it does is it shows serious intent because again, we said we want to drop the price $10,000, but we don't want to we're not trying to scam you out of anything. We're not trying to short you on money. This is just something we feel like we have to do because we're getting less days. So we're gonna shorten this, but we want to put up more earnest money to prove that we're still serious about this when we do want to go through with this transaction. And that honestly probably saved the, the deal because I did have talks with the other agent about, they were scared about us dropping the money and thinking we were trying to whittle them down to a certain price or whatever, when in reality we were actually just we were just worried that by getting us a shorter closing, they were trying to either not get us to look at everything or we wouldn't have time to get all of our inspections and appraisals and all that sort of stuff done. So this is why that shows serious intent there. 
one thing, if, uh, pull up the contract for the Yeah. Or the, the, yeah, the one before and get yeah, that one. Yeah. So you will see in paragraph five, um, earnest money inter and this, again, they added the option period to this too. If you read this, it does say within three days of the effective date. That is why that effective date at the bottom is so important. The buyer must deliver blank or must deliver to title company. Go ahead and type in university title right in that first link. So this is what you would do in a situation if you're filling this out. You would put in universal title company, ask you put the address of the title company. I don't know what it is. Yeah, cool. So let's say 123 Main Street was the address of the title company. You'd put must deliver to university title company as an escrow agent at 123 Main Street. And let's say uh, do 2500 because I think the we're going to do 2500 because we have the contract of this this fake contract we're filling out is 250,000. So we're going to put 2500 for earnest money. So the reason this is important is again you have three days to fill this out. Uh, you want to make sure that this is done in those three days if you do not they basically have the situation where they can if you scroll down actually yeah failure failure to timely deliver earnest money if buyer fails to deliver the earnest money within the time required the seller may terminate this contract or exercise the seller's remedies under paragraph 15 or both by providing notice to buyer before buyer delivers the earnest money so if you do not deliver the earnest money that is where it comes up that the buyer or the seller can sue you for Basically, breaching contract because the contract says you have to deliver within your time period. So this is where if you don't deliver your earnest money in three days, they can just terminate the contract. They can just be like, well, you didn't get it to us in time. Contract's over. I keep your earnest money, or I guess you didn't turn it in. But like, contract's over. Have a good day. We'll put it back up on the market. Go we'll find yourself another house. That's where that comes into play. So that's why it is very key to get this stuff done as quickly as possible. Oh, another thing too. So this $2,500, that is going to be written out to the title company. So if, if your buyer is writing a check, or they usually have cashier's check or money orders, what they'll take. They will not take cash. They will not take, they usually will not take personal checks. So a cashier's check or a money order, this 2,500 or this earnest money will have to be written out to the title company. It is not written out to a broker. It's not written out to an agent. It's not written out to the seller. It's written out to the title company itself. Um, a lot of people get confused because they think the title company is just holding it for the seller, so they'll write it out to the seller. Or we've honestly had people, we've had people who will write it out to Noble's Realty Group and give it to us to go take the title because they think since we're taking it to title, it has to be in our name. That is not correct either. Make sure it is written out to the title company before you accept it. Yeah, and so, so earnest money always goes to the title company. Earnest money always goes to the title company. Yeah, there's no situation where it would not. Um, what you're basically doing is you're paying the title company. They will put it in an escrow account, so basically a like business account, and that business account will hold it until closing. In which case, they will transfer it to the closing funds. Um, if something happens before that, if let's say you breach your contract and that's going to be given to the seller, or if you back out during your auction period and it's given back to you. They will pay out of that SRO account. They will pay you back your money, or they will pay the seller. But basically, what you're doing is you're trusting a third party to hold this. That way, everything it's not there's no you didn't pay it to the seller, and then the seller's like I never got it, and then you go back and forth, and the goes to you. Um, so yeah, it is written to the agent or to the title company. Sorry, not an agent, and not a broker. Yeah, I'm kind of and confused because since the contract's changed, it's kind of hard to figure out what order to use all in. Go back to the slide. All right, we'll talk about this. So yeah, so here's auction money, paragraph 23. This is now also in paragraph five. That's why I'm kind of trying to figure out how to jump around through this. The auction money is now also in paragraph five. Okay, so Auction money also included in paragraph five. The buyer pays a seller a sum of money, and seller gives buyer a number of days that buyer can terminate for any reason. Now, that is any reason. That is not saying that the buyer can terminate if the inspection goes bad or okay. they can just back out whenever. They can back out for any reason as long as it's within their auction period. 
Now, you might hear this if you're listening to Justin's previous lectures or anything like that. Until April 1st, option money was always paid to the seller. So if I was selling my house to Aiden, Aiden would give his agent his cashier's check that was signed to me. Aiden would take it to me. I would receive it and I would write out that I received this, the, the option money basically. What they've done now, which is very nice, is that that also goes to title. So both earnest money and option money are getting paid to title now, and title will hold all of it until it's either passed out or whatever. So, because the, the option money is also, it also is included in the closing costs. So it also counts towards the closing. Um, usual, I think in College Station, the average is $100 for 10 days for closing. So in Houston, I believe it's like 250 for seven days. In Austin, it's about 250 for seven days, but here it's $100 for 10 days. So basically what you're doing is you're, if you put that in the contract, you're agreeing that for 10 days, I can back out for any reason, and I'm going to give you $100 that even if I back out within that 10 days, you get to keep, but I'm just basically paying my way to have that option period. And then if I continue on with the contract and go to closing, that $100 counts towards the closing period. So, um, but the purpose for this is for the buyer to do his due diligence and to basically do his inspections, do his surveys, do everything like that, to make sure the house is what they want. Um, the reason that earnest money can be, can be given back, it can, can be given back to the buyer in this situation if they back out within the option period is because even if you have a serious intent to buy a $300,000 house, if you go in and do an inspection and find out the foundation's falling apart, you might have been seriously intent on buying that place, but it's not your fault you're backing out, foundations fall apart. Like you, you've done an inspection and found stuff that's made you not want that place anymore. Um, so that is where you're gonna back out of the contract and that is why the earnest money would be, be given back to the buyer in that situation. Now again, the parties agree on the number of days. Again, it's another blank in the contract that is negotiable, just like the amount of earnest money. I did a contract recently where I put, um, I think I put 100 for seven days and they said, how about 200 for seven days? And I said, about 150 for seven days, and then we disagreed. Um, so it is a negotiable part of a contract, just like earnest money, just like the sales price, just like everything else. Now, again, the option money must be delivered within three days of the effective date. Now, this is what's tricky because it used to be, it used to be much harder because, for example, if I got into contract with Aiden, Aiden selling his house, I wanted to buy his property. I would act like I would basically give, or if I was the agent, let's say I was the buyer's agent, the buyer would give me the checks to take the title, like the cashier's check to take the title, and he would also give me a cashier's check to take to the seller to get the option and the earnest money. I've done deals before where we buy a house in Hempstead or in Navasota, and the owners are in Tomball or Spring or Side Fair or Klein or whatever, in, or Katy in Houston. The problem with that is that it makes it where if I'm the buyer's agent, I end up having to take one check to the title company, which would be where the property is located in Navasota, let's say, and I have to take the other check to Katie to take it to the seller, which is a pain in the butt. So, because so, it's annoying having to drive around everywhere and throw stuff out. I did a deal recently where the property was located in Hempstead and the seller was located in Beaumont on the opposite side of Houston. So, luckily, we found a deal where we could just wire the money to the title, and then we found a way to get, have the money transfer over to the seller through that. Or else I would have had to basically drive to Beaumont <laughs> from College Station, go down to KD, drop, or go down to Hempstead, drop off one check, and then drive to Beaumont to drop off the other check. I didn't want to do that. We found a way to make it all work, but that's why that was very annoying in the past. Um, another good thing is that title companies will usually take wire transfers as well. Almost all of them do now. That has been super helpful. I did a deal recently, again, where we were kind of on opposite sides of the city um, and they had to do or I guess I was at H I was in Houston at the time they were in Caldwell we were at the title company in Caldwell but they were from Austin so to give have them give money to the to the title company in Caldwell I would either have to drive to Austin to pick up the check or have them drive down to Caldwell from Austin to drop off the money either way seems annoying and inconvenient for somebody so we actually called title and they were allowing wire transfers so i just had them call title and wire the money to title and everything was good so 
that make it a lot easier. Um, another thing with that is you never accept personal checks and you will never accept cash ever, ever. Never accept cash. Um, all it takes is somebody giving you the wrong amount of money on accident. They try to give you 3,000 and give you 2,800. You take it title. Title says you didn't give me all the money. You go back to your buyer and be like, you didn't give me all the money. And the buyer goes, yes, I did. You stole it. You're in trouble. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be anybody being malicious. It's just, that just happens sometimes. So that is why you will never, ever take cash um, ever for any reason. And even checks, because your checks, personal checks, you can just go cash them then not something you want to be in a situation of where something doesn't get somewhere and suddenly it's on you when you're like, I wasn't trying to, I'm sorry, I wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> so just never accept cash or checks. Um, if they give you a money order, you are allowed to run that to the title company and drop it off. That's fine. Um, but just never take cash. Can't stress that enough. <laughs> like, I've had, I've seen way too many things go wrong with that situation. So, um, yeah, so never take cash and that's great. Also, time is of the essence for this paragraph. Again, we talked about um, time is of the essence in paragraph five and also along in those like six agendas, I think it was. Um, this is, time is of the essence for this. You cannot wait. It is three days. You have to get it done as soon as possible. And then also with your option period, you can't wait around. You have to get it done as soon as possible. You have to get your stuff scheduled and get working on that stuff as quickly as you can. Oh, uh, go ahead and open the contract real quick. So one thing that is uh, right there is fine. Um, one thing that is interesting is that if you look uh, right here on paragraph on section two of the earnest money, it talks about if you have three days to deliver, the, you have three days to deliver the money, but if that last day ends up on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, the time to deliver the earnest money, or yeah, opportunity to earnest money is extended until the end of the next day that is not a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday. So if we were to do a contract today, let's say it's Thursday, we would do a contract now, we would have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you would have till Monday when the title company closes to turn in that earnest money. That gives you a little, and if Monday was a holiday, I've seen deals that are done on Basically, the, the earnest money is due Saturday, but it's Saturday, Sunday, and then it's New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, so they don't have to turn it until Wednesday, because even though they start on Thursday, but whatever, yeah. that happens. So, <laughs> like, um, so you might get those situations, but just remember that it is the next business day, if not, if it, if it ends up on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday. Uh, I believe for the options for that a little bit, when I was looking through it earlier, Yeah, I remember what it used to be is it says, um, okay, yeah, so, so here you go. Notices under this paragraph must be given by 5 p.m. local time where the property is located. So again, it has to be 5 p.m. You have to turn your option money in by 5 p.m. where the property is located. So I, again, you'll have clients that are from California that are buying houses here or whatever. You might have a situation where they go, well, it was only three. And you're like, well, technically it was six or you know, whatever. It's like, so you don't want to get stuck in a situation where you're, you're, trying to jump around curls because they think it's a different time than what it is where the property is located. You won't have to deal with that going anywhere else. You know, Texas is under one time zone and you can only work in Texas. So it's easy for us, <laughs> but sometimes you will have buyers from other, you know, I, I have a buyer that's from TC that was sending us stuff. And so there was just a weird situation where that could have come up, you know, depending on time of pay. Also, termination option. This is also really, really, really key does not mention anything about Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday. It's very annoying. Um, so if the contract is due on a Saturday, that option money better be with them on Saturday. Um, I think that might have, scroll up a little bit, I think that might have changed now. Let me see. Okay, yes, yeah, so never mind. I take that back. That is changed now because the option fee is included in this paragraph. It was not before. Um, so in paragraph two, or section two, if last day deliver earnest option or additional earnest is on Saturday, Sunday, we go holiday. So clarify that. We are good there. Um, another thing about this paragraph, so right here on this one, put 100. So yeah, let's say you're doing $100 for 10 days. So you put 100 there and then down here in B, 
put ten. Oh, uh, but, but, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is how you would fill out if you're doing a, an auction period of ten days for a hundred dollars. You would put a hundred in that blank up here. So this is, you would fill out twenty five hundred dollars for earnest money and a hundred dollars as the option. And then down below, you'd state that the option is going to be ten days long. Um, if you scroll up, there is a section for additional earnest money. So this would be a weird, like, I haven't done any of these yet, but basically if you were saying, I'm gonna put in $2,000 now, and then I'll put in $500 in 10 days to prove that I'm still serious about it or whatever, you can do that. Um, but that usually does not, you will very rarely fill out this blank here, or these blanks. Um, one thing that you could do is, for example, if you have a client that's out of town, let's say they are, you know, they're a, they're in Germany, but they're an investor who likes to, they come back and forth every other month and they buy properties and whatever. Um, they might be out of the country and they can't send you a check within three days because it won't get to you in time. However, um, you either have to figure out a way to wire this to title. That would be a good option. Just have them call title and see if they can wire it over within that time period, have title sign off on it. Um, I know one thing I talked about ju to, ju to Justin about last time he taught this class was like you could technically fill out that they will do 2500 here within 10 days and leave this stuff blank because again this is negotiable you could put zero for earnest but then additional earnest put 2500 and put 10 days or 15 days but that looks really suspicious <laughs> so, so that is something you technically could do but you most likely send that contract over and they will go what's going on here because this basically means that you now have 15 days to back out without losing earnest money because you don't have earnest money in, in the first place like it gets very tricky in that situation. Um, another thing for option money, uh, if you scroll down to where the notice was for failure, yeah. So failure to timely deliver option fee, if no dollar amount is stated as the option fee, or if buyer fails to deliver the option fee within the time required, the buyer shall not have unrestricted right to terminate this contract. Basically, if you do not, if you put zero for your option fee, you will not get an option period. I just put zero in zero days and everybody agrees to that. Or if you put 100 for 10 days and then just don't turn it in in time, you might think you have 10 days for the option. If you turn the option in on day seven, you can't back out at any point. That you were locked in the contract from the day to the effective date was on there. So there is no backing out and saying, well, I stole my option period. There was no option period. You didn't turn the money in in time. So that is, a, that is what the, the cost of doing, failing to do this is basically. Um, and here you go, E, time is in the essence for this paragraph. That's again where that's stated. You have to do this in a very, very timely manner. Go back to the, uh, the Okay, so here we go. So uh, paragraph six is going to be about the title policy. Uh, paragraph six, A and B. So in the title policy, the parties will choose the title company. RESPA prohibits the seller from acquiring a specific title company as a condition of the sale. What this is stating is that in the, in the contract, you basically, both parties can choose what title company they want. You can say, I really like university. The seller can say, well, I like, I, I do land title. And you basically just have to come to an agreement on what title policy you're going to use or what title company you're going to use. So uh, there is no one person that gets to choose and what this is basically saying is that the seller cannot say, well, I am not selling this house unless it's through these people. The seller cannot demand which company to go through. I will say it is usually easier if you're in that dispute. For example, here in College Station, University, or Aggieland, it's easier to just pick whichever title company, if you don't, if you can't agree, whatever title company it was bought previously with was. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the they will keep all records of every title policy they basically ever given out. And so if you have a house that is for sale and y'all can't agree on what title company to use, find out what it was sold at last. If the last company they used was university title, use university title, they can get you a title policy within about 24 hours versus if you use a new title company, it might take them a week to figure out, to actually get the title policy all formulated together. Um, whereas if they already have basically everything on record, except for it's a new, like it's a new owner now. <laughs> they can just switch, they can just get that up real quick for you. Let's see. 
go back to the slide for you, or the contract. The title policy is also subject to eight printed exceptions in paragraph six of the contract and existing building and zoning ordinances. Now, so here you go right here, the title policy. So the seller shall furnish to buyer at seller's expense. Seller almost always pays for, like, I would say 90%. How, how often would you say the seller pays for the title policy? I would say basically every time. Yes, basically, yeah, basically every time the seller is going to pay for the title policy. Um, and then this title company right here is going to be the same you would use as that um, earnest money where you would send the earnest money to. So in this situation, the university title company. And scroll up just to show that. Yeah, and so basically this, whatever goes in this blank, it's going to be in the exact same blank down here in paragraph six. So, um, yeah, so you're basically in this situation, you're using university title as your title company. And then 6B, or no, six, uh, we'll stick with 6A for a second. Um, 6A8, this is a very tricky one down here. So the standard printed exception, discrepancies, conflicts, shortages in area, boundary line, encroachments, or protrusions, or overlapping improvements. A lot of brokerages will want you to select box one, will not be amended or deleted from the title policy. I know Justin very hardly preaches to click box two and do shortages in area. Now what that's basically doing is it's, it's an extra cost. You will usually buyer, click buyer here. That is a normal practice as well, um, that the buyer will pay for this. What you're basically doing is that if there's any conflicts in the title policy, let's say something's changed or stuff's been moved or there's basically a shortage in area that you thought you were going to get. And let's say the title policy comes out, they start doing their their work and they realize that like your house goes right through the boundary line for the plat next to you. What that basically does is they will pay for you to move it and put like, you know, remove that section and put it on the other side of the house or whatever. They will, that is paid for as opposed to it just being like, well, that's not your property. You have to get rid of that. That's basically you're getting insurance to cover in those certain situations. Yeah, so again, you'll have a lot of brokerages that'll tell you click box one. We just really recommend you click box two. I think it's like $95 added on to closing costs, but it's extremely worth it in those situations where you have to get thousands of dollars worth of repairs or whatever, because something's too short or too long or there's protrusions in your neighbor's yard or whatever. So um, do you always do the buyer and who do you represent? So that is a good question. So as you will always be filling this out as a buyer. The buyer will always fill this contract out and send it to the seller. The seller will always counter it, but you will always fill this out as the buyer. It is normal practice to put buyer here, but I I usually put seller just because as a buyer's agent, your duty is to the buyer to make it as good as possible for the buyer. So by the time the contract's over, it'll most likely be this. It will say shortage and area at expense of the buyer because that's normal. But I always put seller, and if they counter saying buyer, I try it. If they don't counter, cool, like we did it. <laughs> they're they're going to pay the extra 95 bucks. But um, I think it's very key to have this in here. And again, your duty is to the buyer. That is a really good question. When I fill these contracts out, I basically put everything at the expense of the seller because that's best for my buyer and my duty is to them. So I'm going to put everything to the seller and just if, the, if, if when they get the contract, they want to counter saying stuff should be the buyer's expense, that's no big deal. That's again, this is normal to have the buyer pay for it because it is the buyer that is kind of worrying about this. <laughs> so it is usually the buyer pays for this, but um, but again, if your if your duty is to the buyer, you would you would put sell in this situation just to see if it works basically. All right, and paragraph B is the title commitment. So basically the contract will call for a delivery of title commitment within 20 days of this contract. Yeah, so uh, receive a contract within 20 days of this contract, the seller shall furnish the buyer a commitment of title insurance and at buyer's expense, legible copies and restrictive covenants and documents, evidence exceptions in the commitment other than the standard printed exceptions. So there are exceptions for this. Um, if you look down here, kind of the second half of this paragraph, buyer, uh, let's see. If the commitment and exception documents are not delivered to buyer within the specified time 
the time for delivery will be automatically extended up to 15 days or three days before the closing date. Now, the reason it says or three days before the closing date is because if you look at 20 plus 15, that is usually more than what a normal closing is 30 days. So that's usually over, that's 35 days. That's over your normal closing time. So they have this or three days before closing date to specify that whatever is sooner, that is what they'll go. If, if you have a 60 day closing, you will get 35. If you do not have a 60, if you have a 30 day closing, you'll have 27 days basically. Um, and that is if the exception or the commitment and exception documents are not delivered to the buyer. So again, as a buyer, I don't want, um, yeah, I don't want title working super fast because as a buyer, it's nice to have 27 days to figure this all out, like to it not be a headache for me and I can back out or whatever. Whereas as a seller, I want to call somewhere and then be like, I can get it to you tomorrow. Like, cool. Like, cause then all this is just, you, you, you're well inside your 20 days. Um, how often, Justin, have you seen any title commitments go like past this 27 days or whatever? To... They normally, on title commitments, you normally get those, I mean, within days. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. That's right. Because okay. there's such a strict deadline that they, yeah, they, they, they do not want to miss it. Yes. <laughs> it is very key for them not to miss that. Well, another thing with this is that, so again, with the title commitments, title searches, title companies, you are never allowed to do a title search for your client. That is what a title company is for. That is not your job. If a client wants to keep costs down, hey, I don't, you know, I'm why I know you're you're my agent, but I'm not I'm not looking to keep costs too high. I want to keep them down as low as I can. Let's not even use a title company. I mean, you know, real estate, you can just kind of look at all the forming and everything. No, no, I can't. <laughs> it's like I am not allowed to do that. Like that is as an agent, yeah. that is not your job. If the client wants to do it themselves. Fine. Like again, they can keep costs low and do it themselves if they want to and not use a title company, but they're running that risk to themselves yeah. of not finding stuff or whatever. Whereas if you, as an agent, you don't want that falling back, you don't want that liability coming onto you. So again, you will either you will use a title company or they will have to do it themselves. I have not done any where they've done it themselves. We've always used a title company. It's just easier that way. It's a little bit more money, but it's always easier. Um, Justin, have you ever had clients do their own title searches just to keep costs down and stuff like that? Only people that are experienced, like if they've yeah. been doing investors, very rarely, but if they're investors, some of them might do it. But you mm -hmm. most of the time, they're still going to get a commitment just okay. for the sake of the insurance. Of yeah, the insurance. And the yeah. Yeah. But you will have a couple you here and there. Okay. And there is a form actually that you can give them if they do decide to tell you that I want to say McKenna tells you, Travis, I want to do it myself. I've been doing this many years. I know how to do it. There is a form that she can complete that you can keep in your file statement that she can find it. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So if you were to do the search for them, would that be unauthorized? Yeah. Just yes, you cannot, you cannot do it for them. If I don't think that would be necessarily an office practice of law. It would just be you're, just not, you're yeah. giving basically you're basically put outside. Up. Yeah, you're putting too much liability on yourself. Um, and your broker. Yeah, and your broker. <laughs> Justin will be very angry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go ahead and go back to this. Well, that's how I get angry. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't do something like that? Okay, also, that's why I don't Knowingly, too. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, here you go. The title company delivers the commitment and copies of the restrictive covenants to the buyer at the address listed in paragraph 21. Um, I believe that is that is actually where you would put. Am I, am I right, Justin? And at twenty one is the that is the paragraph that has clients name, care of agent. Is that right? Uh, well, they changed the contract, so you might yeah, pull, pull that the contract. contract up, double check that. I believe that's still the right number, but I'm not one hundred percent sure. It's hard working on that one. Whatever that is. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Everything will be given to this where it says notices. All notices from one party that must be in writing, effective when mail to hand delivered or transmitted by fax, transmission as follows. And again, like I said last time, this is where you would put, uh, let's say, I think for this contract, technically, if we're just going to keep filling this contract out, Aiden is selling his property to me. I'm buying this property from him. So what you would put here is you would put 
Travis Stahl, care of whoever the agent's name is. So let's say McKenna was my agent, you put Travis Stahl, and then just C-O. And then you put McKenna's name. So you put Perry McKenna and then for phone, email, and fax, you would put all of her information down since she is my agent. So it's the client care of agent. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was looking that up the other day because I was trying to clarify that because now why do you do that, Travis? Why why is McKenna wanting to put her information in not Oh we your... talked about this Okay. That's what we said today. Yeah. Basically to go over it again. Um, what you don't want is actually back that up. It, yeah, so you're the seller, just go ahead and put your name in. Like, so in this situation, Aiden is selling me his house. So he puts his name, his phone number, his email address, his fax. He puts all of his information in here. Well, in the meantime, McKenna has all of the office's information in here or her, her, as an agent, her information in here. Well, what happens is we all get this contract. We go through closing and everything. Well, guess who has my information? Only McKenna, because I've been talking to her doing the closing and everything. Guess who has Aiden's information? Everybody. <laughs> so what happens in this situation is we go through closing. I finish up closing. McKenna, you know, we, we go through closing. McKenna talks to me. We, we, you know, she sends me emails congratulating me on my new house, all that sort of stuff. Aiden, in the meantime, sells his house. Well, all of his information is right here. So McKenna just starts sending him emails saying, congratulations on selling your house. Do you mind if I send you a gift over at whatever your new address is? And, you know, here I'd like to send you some blank, plug and blank. And a lot of times, if it's the other way around where this is, let's say this is the seller, Aiden, in this little blank, he's going to put his new address in where he's moving to because he's selling his house. So his mailing address is now this new address. Well, now not only do I have his phone, email, and fax, but I have his address too, so I can send him a little gift basket. You know, I can send him a gift basket congratulating him on selling his house and, you know, add his, I know here we add his email into his fax into our database to send him little notices and, you know, everything here in our market to him a little bit. Well, in the meantime, I'm over here. I can't get nothing because whoever agent, Aiden's agent is, they don't have any of my information, so they can't get a hold of me. Um, I have... I think every contract I have done, or at least, I'd say most of them. Majority. Majority well, of them. Lazy agent. Yeah, majority of them. I have this set up really nicely where I have my client's name, care of me, all of my information. And on the other side, of whatever, you know, which way it is, the other side has all of the, the buyer or the seller's information on it. And so it's all just right there. So if I wanted to, I could just call them. You can't call them while the deal's going on, but you, once the deal's over, they're just the potential client for a future and yes they probably won't buy anything in the like right now because they just bought a place or just sold a place but they might have friends that do they might have and as opposed to being like well i dealt with this one agent and they were okay but never heard from them again well you know the other agent was really nice he sent me a bunch of stuff after we finished and whatever and then suddenly you're marketing to not only him but his co-workers and his family and everything and so that is why we always put this <laughs> your client's name care of you as an agent is because you don't want that happening to your clients or your clients are getting stolen from the other agent because they can just have all their information right here. So, but wait a minute. I'm a, so if I'm representing Aiden and I'm a lazy agent, um, and you, if a tenant contacts Aiden, I'm going to call her and I'm going to chew her out and I'm going to tell her, don't you be talking to my client because I have an, an exclusive right to sell and she can't talk to him, right? Not anymore. Why not? It's over. That's right. It's over. It's all gone now. Once that exclusive right to sell is gone, even if it says five years on it, yeah. Once that transaction is done, that agency is gone, and my relationship with Aiden is ceased. Yeah. And I believe on the exclusive right to sell or the buyer's representation, it actually does say the agreement, the relationship between these parties will last for this long or until the party sells or buys a property. So even if me and again, me and Wyatt have this relationship for eight years, yep. as soon as he buys a property, it's over. And so somebody like he's just he's as much of a you know, just a potential prospect for every other client as he is for me at that point. So that's why it's, it, even if 
Aiden has this exclusive right to sell agency with whatever agent. As soon as he sells his property, he's just a guy. Anybody so, can contact him. So he's just open again at that point. And let me tell you this, guys and gals, I'll give you a real life example. The home I just listed yesterday, put it on the market and all. It's a good buddy of mine. He used to be a real estate agent. He got out of real estate. Now he's in the oil industry making good money. And he's been doing that. And he said he put the house on the market himself on Zillow because he's a real estate agent. He's done this before. He was just going to sell it himself through Zillow. He said, all I got off of there was other real estate agents calling him and saying, let me list your house. Let me list your house. And he finally would tell him, he'd say, I'm listing with Justin Nobles. That's who I'm listing with. Start, you know, don't call me anymore. Leave me alone. And one agent said, well, what has he got or what makes him so special compared to me? I'm, I'm way better than him. And he said, excuse me? He said, I'm way better than him, and I can put him to shame any day of the week. Well, let me tell you something. Think about that, Wyatt. If, you're, if your best friend, Travis, you and Travis are best friends, you know, I've been friends for a long time, and Aiden calls you up one day and starts bad-mouthing Travis, who's your best friend, is that going to push you away from Travis? <laughs> That definitely, makes you, that definitely makes you want to work with Aiden more. <laughs> this is, you see kind of what I'm saying. So don't ever get to that point where if they tell you, if somebody ever tells you that I'm working with McKenna and that's who I'm going to list with, don't be one of those sleazy slime ball type realtors. If they already have somebody, let it be. Yeah. Move on to the next one because you're not going to get them to break ranks from their friends. It's yeah. just not going to happen. And then if you start doing things like that, it only makes you look even worse as a real estate agent. Yep. So just FYI, because he did list with me three months. He tried to do it by himself, couldn't do it. I put it on the market yesterday and I already have two 10,000 over list uh, contracts right now. So I'm telling y'all, don't end up in that particular situation. Don't become that type of person where you have to bad mouth. If you got a bad mouth, that's, you're not doing it right. Okay. That's a good point though. It's like there's a certain point where you can market to people, but at the same time you're not trying to be an able and take over people. So it's like because again, it, how does that even make you want to work with them in the first place? Yeah. Oh, I'm way better than them. It's like you're you sound egotistical. I don't want to work with you anyway. Like, it's like, it's like, and you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot there. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good point though. Uh, you can get right to this one. And the sad thing is, is that's how Aiden really is. So just FYI, yeah. he'll, it's hard to to yeah, it's he'll try to steal your people. So. It's wrong. <laughs> <We'll> say so. <laughs> All right, whatever, man. Two against one. It's pretty hard to win five anyways. <laughs> I'll just accept it. All right, so now we have the survey. Paragraph 6C of the Wonderful Family Residential Contract. So in 6C1, sellers that furnish the existing survey and the T47 affidavit, we'll go over those in a second the parties negotiate the number of days after the effective date that both the affidavit and the survey must be delivered to the buyer. Um, go ahead, open it. Yeah, so basically here we have, um, or scroll to six, yes, six, six, okay. There we go, there we go. So here you go, paragraph six C, the survey. Survey must be made by and registered uh, profession, made by a registered professional land surveyor acceptable to the title company and the buyer's lenders. That is also very key. The lender has to accept them, not just the title company or not just the seller or the buyer. So what you want to put in here is, uh, if you put that first box next to one and then put five, the five is the average for this too. So within five days after the effective date of the contract, seller shall furnish the buyer and, and title company seller's existing survey of the property and a residential real property affidavit promulgated by the Texas Department of Insurance. That is what the T47 is. If seller fails to furnish the existing survey or affidavit within the time prescribed, the buyer shall obtain a new survey at seller's expense no later than three days prior to closing date. If the existing survey or affidavit is not acceptable to the title company or buyer's lenders, buyer shall obtain a new survey at, and then click buyer there. Uh, to the right. 
at buyer's expense no later than three days prior to closing date. Now, again, this is another situation where it is common practice for it to be buyer, but like you were saying, McKenna, your duty is to the buyer. You could put seller here if you want. <clears throat> it will most likely come back as buyer. Now, what this paragraph is basically stating is that within five days of the contract date, the seller needs to give the title company um, the survey they have for the property, the current survey. Now, it, that is if they have a survey. If they have a survey, this is the box you will click that within five days, they will have to send that survey to the title company. And a T47 affidavit, which is basically a form that will show any small discrepancies between the survey when they got it and what's going on now. So if there is an extra little piece here or whatever, it'll kind of show those little changes. If there's anything major, if you put in a pool, you cannot just use a T47, you have to get a new survey. Um, but if you put up a shed and it's just a little box, you can usually just get a T47 and they'll kind of rectify that basically without having to furnish a whole new survey. <clears throat> However, if the seller fails to furnish the existing survey within the time prescribed, the buyer shall obtain a survey at the seller's expense. Now, the reason this box down here is usually says buyer's expense is because this bold is basically stating that if within those five days, the seller does not give the buyer a survey or give the title company or the lender a survey, the buyer can just go get one at the seller's expense. So you don't even have to notify the seller that you're doing this. If it's day four and you haven't received a survey, you can just start calling surveyors and just have somebody send out there. You can pick the most expensive one in town if you want. It doesn't really matter. Have someone go out there and do a survey. And then if you get to the closing table, let's say you're the seller's agent and you get to the closing table, <clears throat> they're going through their contracts or their closing disclosures. And you see that there's actually a $1,800 charge for a survey when they already turned a survey in. Your seller's gonna turn to you and go, what is this for? I already had a survey, I just gave it to the title company. I gave it to you to give the title. Didn't you do that already? Yeah, I did that on like day seven or whatever. Like it's, I, I turned it in. Like it's no big deal. Well, since it's day seven and we only have five days here, I just went out and got a new one. As, as a buyer's agent, just go and get a new one. No big deal. Like it doesn't matter to you. You're getting a brand new survey. That looks really nice. And then it's on the expense of the seller. They can't really argue anything because it wasn't done in time. Um, so that is why this blank down here actually says buyers is what this is stating is that if the existing survey is not acceptable to the title company or the buyer's lenders, so it's the buyer's lenders that have to also approve of the survey. If your lender, if you're the buyer, if your lender does not accept the survey, that's not the seller's fault. That's your lender being picky or that's, that's not exactly yours. That's not their fault. That's your fault in that situation. So that is why it's the buyer's expense to go get a new survey at that point. Um, if the survey is out of date and the title company says cool, everybody says, like, it's not out of date, but it's just an older survey. And everybody's, it's the same thing. Like, it's all good. Like, roads are the same. Everything's the same. Like, no big deal. Class the same. Looks good to me. But then your lender goes, ah, I don't like it because I think this might be over there or whatever. I don't, I don't really trust it. Whatever. That's not their fault. That's your lender's, that's your lender not liking it. That's on you, not the seller. <clears throat> if you have a survey, then within you click this box C or box two that within five days of the effective date of the contract, or this is again, if you don't have a survey, sorry, the one is if you have a survey, two is if you don't have a survey, um, that within five days of the effective date of the contract, the buyer will get a new survey at the buyer's expense. The buyers need to receive the survey on the date of actual receipt or the date specified in the paragraph. Now, does it take five days to get a survey? <laughs> I wish <laughs> that's a good point. No, it usually takes roughly three to four weeks, roughly three weeks. I've, again, I just had a survey done on a really small piece of land that took eight weeks. So it can be ridiculous. So in this box, you would usually put 25 or 30 just to make sure you have time to get a survey done, basically. You don't want to put, you don't want to put something really small and you don't have time to get anything done. I put a longer date so you have, because this is not just you ordering a survey, this is you getting a survey and giving it the title. Mm -hmm. so, that everything has to be done by this time. And then three is just stating that the seller is gonna pay for it at the seller's expense. So same as two, only it's the seller paying for it, not the buyer. And again, if you were filling this out as a buyer's agent, which is what you will be doing, I always just check three, just to see. Um, 
it'll usually get sent back with two. Again, that is common practice is that that happens, but I usually check three just to see what happens. So, because if they accept it, cool. Um, I, well, I should say, I always check one that within five days that they'll, they'll turn the one they have in. If they don't have it, they can't turn it in those five days, at which point I can go get one on expense of the seller. So that's why that's really nice. Um, but yeah, two is just saying if they don't have it, the buyer will do it. Three is saying if they don't have it, the seller's going to pay for it. <clears throat> right, so next we have objections, that paragraph D there. So the buyer has a limited time to make objections to the commitment, exception documents, and survey. So what this is saying is that the buyer has a period of time when everything comes in to go, oh, I don't like, I don't, this isn't what I wanted. I object to this, this, and this. That's not why I'm here. I'm out of here. That's basically what this is saying. So the blank in paragraph 6D can be used to protect the buyer if there are specific things she wants to do with the property. This must be determined before closing. What this, what, I don't know if you do this, Aiden, but I know for me, in this blank, I always put, Residential and rental use. Every single time. I always put residential and rental use. That blank is never, that spot is never blank. And if I fill out a contract, it'll say residential and rental use. I might even put residential, recreational, and rental use or whatever. All that is saying is that if the title policy comes back and it turns out that they can't allow rental properties there, for some, like the you know, title policy just won't allow rental properties in that area, then we have the option to back out. Because we are saying that, or if it comes back and it says, well, this is a commercial spot, you can't put residential there. Well, then I don't, we don't need it, so I'm out of here. Now, the reason I always put residential or rental use is because you never know what's going to happen down the line. You never know when you have a buyer, if you're a buyer's agent, if you have a buyer that's going to buy the property in 10 years, they want to move on, but they don't want to sell their house, they might as well just rent it out. That's not something they can figure out they want to do right now. So I just always put it in there in case that comes up later. That they are allowed to do that. It says so in the title policy, they are allowed to rent it out. Um, I know for my parents, my parents bought a house in Galveston. My dad had a couple rental properties, but they weren't planning on renting out that house. They were going to live in it forever and then probably just, you know, if they wanted to move, just move on. But they were living in this house. When my dad passed away, my mom wants to move, but she doesn't want to sell it, so she's just going to rent it out. Well, luckily, we put they put in here, they're allowed to rent that property out. Because if they didn't put that in here and title policy came back and said, well, they can't rent it, but all they want to do is live in it, like own it, they're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, it could come back that they try to go rent it and they go, well, you can't rent that property. And now they have a property that she has to sell or leave or live in or just have a, like, make it. Like, like it cuts out your options. And so usually by putting residential and rental use to kind of cover all of the things your seller wants to do. The reason I said I sometimes put recreational use, if it's a really large plot of land, if it's 100 acres, but recreational because that means you can hunt there. That means you can kind of do recreational activities there. You can go out and hunt, you can you know go fishing, you can do stuff like that. And so that covers them in that situation where you can't have people saying, well you're not allowed to fish out here. And it's like, well I can do it says I can do recreational activities here, so therefore I'm allowed to do this sort of stuff. That's why I put that there just to cover that up. And usually this date says it's usually I think 21 is what it usually says. Is that within 21 days? Because like Justin was saying, it's usually within days you'll get the title policy back. And so this is stating that within 21 days after the buyer receives the commitment, you're allowed to back out. So this, this is giving you plenty of time that if you receive the title policy on day four, you have till day 25 to go, oh, wait, I can't rent it out if I move? Oh, okay, I can't. I'm not going to do that. This just gives you a little extra time to back out for that reason. So that's why that usually has a, a little bit longer date there. I'll go ahead and put residential. If we're filling this up with a project, let's keep going. Oh, my bad. Put 10 days in that point. I don't know why I'm thinking of 20 though. I'm thinking of the survey. Sorry, I'm thinking of the survey with 20 days. It is 10 days usually this month. But again, a little bit longer. So again, you can receive that title commitment and then have a have a week or so to figure out if you actually want to live in that property. And then just scroll down. So E is going to be title notices. So this is just certain legislation requires a variety of notices to the buyer. The Broker Lawyer Committee and TREC have uh, included a lot of notices. Basically, one through 10 are all notices. So if you're going through a contract, there's like an entire page that is just notices, not, no blanks to fill in. 
So it's going to keep scrolling down here. Let's look at this. So yeah, you got all of these notices. You don't really have to memorize any of these. I think 6E. Is that right? Oh, never mind, it's one. I'm, I'm confused. Go back up to one. Sorry. Yeah, so right here, this abstract of title policy, the broker advises buyer to have an abstract of title. That is the only one you'll probably be um, tested on. What this means is that as a broker, you have to advise your client to get a title company or a title policy. Um, again, like how he was saying, you can have, there are some clients that can just want to do it themselves. But you're required as an agent or as a broker to advise your buyer to get a title box because it's in their best interest. The, in, the insurance is good. And even though they might want to do it because it saves money, you're just advised to, you're, you're required to advise them of it. Um, if they say no, that is okay. You just have to do your due diligence to advise them of that. Um, and then two, you put in here if they're, if they're in a uh, homeowners association route. That's kind of all. Section two is you just put yes is or is not subject to a bank sort of membership in a property owners association or an HOA. Um, I think you just want to know. Okay, let me look at all this. Yeah, so as you can see, there's just a lot of notices. Um, paragraph seven is going to be over the property condition. So basically, 7A gives the right to the buyer and their agent to access the property at reasonable times. So this is your access for inspections. Now, reasonable times means that in your auction period, uh, how we talked about, I think it was with Stefan that we talked about, you had um, equitable title in the property. So even though it's not your house yet, you still have equitable title. You can still kind of come and go on the property at reasonable times. Um, this is what that is applying to. You have equitable title. You are allowed to go on the property to do inspections, to do stuff like that at reasonable times. You cannot schedule an inspection for 2 a.m. That is not reasonable. You will get shot. That's, <laughs> don't do that. That is not reasonable. Um, another thing that this states is that you the what the inspection will do is it'll uh, they gave basically to look at the property and see if anything is wrong to check if they want to back out the contract or not. That is the main reason for inspections. Uh, go in, make sure the foundation's good, make sure everything, if you walk around and like the house, make sure that everything you can't see, you also like about the house. So if you walk around and like the look of everything, make sure the things you can't look at are also in good condition. Uh, another thing is the seller has to have utilities turned on. So this is why it says access inspection and utilities. The seller has to have utilities turned on for the entire time that you're under contract. You cannot as a seller, go in and turn off your utilities because you're trying to save money. Um, I know Justin has told stories about he's had people, he will schedule an inspection with somebody who will go out there and do the inspection. They go out there and all the utilities are turned off. Well, the inspector can go, I don't know if the property is in good condition because I can't check the water, I can't check the heat, I can't check the electricity, I can't check the gas, I can't check anything. So I don't know if the property is in good condition. I can't tell you that. If I were you, I'd advise that you have me come back out here once the utilities are turned on and we do another inspection. I don't think they're going to let that other inspection go for free. So if you're a buyer's agent, you will have a client that's upset with you because you will have to pay twice for an inspection. Yeah. They get an inspection done both times so they can come out and do it when the utilities are actually on. And as a seller's agent, you're going to hear a lot of stuff from the buyer's agent <laughs> and they'll probably try to negotiate some way of having to pay back in closing or something that you're going to have to, um, because they have to double pay because of your fault. So, and, and a lot of times if that's the case, they'll just back out of the contract as a buyer. You just don't want it. I'm not doing it. Like if, if you're not even, if you don't trust the property enough to keep the utilities on or you're cheap enough to keep the utilities, if you're cheap enough to take the utilities off in the last month, then what else have you skipped out on the property? You probably covered up some, like, you know, some of this, you probably covered up some of that. That's how people will think. So, it's best just to keep everything on and just leave it on for the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 7B is about the seller's disclosure. Um, this is that uh, code 5.008. I think Stefan was talking about. I think Kelly said she was looking at that number for some reason. So this is that seller's disclosure. Um, the seller's disclosure is a requirement of the Texas property code. So it has, you cannot sell a property 
without having at least one of these checked or going through the process of a seller's disclosure. So um, if you were a seller, I know I talked about this the other day, if you were a seller, you want this first box checked that says that the buyer has already received the notice. Now, the reason you want that box checked is again, um, or the reason that could be checked, like we said before, if I go do a listing presentation, I'm going to go to that person's house, do a listing presentation, be like, here, here's what I'm gonna do with your, you know, your property, I'm gonna take some photos, I'm gonna put it up in the MLS, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna try to market it, this and that and the other. If you don't mind, fill out the seller's disclosure for me to help me fill out the items on the MLS that I need to. Now, the reason that is a good way to do it is that on the MLS, when you go to put it in, there will be a lot of boxes for like how many fireplaces does it have? Is it a gas or electric stove? Is the stove convection or circuit lighting? There's all these types of boxes you'll have to fill out for literally everything on the property. What are the floors made of? What are the walls made of? How, how is the ceiling? All that sort of stuff. So it's good to get a seller's disclosure finished beforehand so you actually know what to fill out for all that stuff. I've seen properties before where like all that stuff's blank and it's like I don't even know what the floors are made out of in this house because they haven't put it up yet. I don't know if that's real wood or if that's vinyl, I don't know. Whereas if you had your seller fill all that stuff out on the seller's disclosure, you can actually fill the property in correctly. So you know, when people look at the house, they know what they're getting into. But then also the seller's disclosure uh, limits future liability. So if a seller shows the buyer that the roof is 28 years old and the buyer comes in and then goes, this is, this is an old roof. Well, yeah, I showed that on the seller's disclosure. You can't come back and you. And it basically, the AC unit's been there for 46 years. The buyer buys the property, AC breaks the next day. You probably should have guessed that. It's like, it, it basically helps limit the future liability of the seller by having this stuff kind of written down, how old everything is, when everything was changed. If something's happened previously, as far as if there was a flood, if there was this, that's all listed in the seller's disclosure. Um, if the hailstorm that came through recently, you know, messed up your roof, you'd have to put roof repair when it happened, when the damage to the roof was done, all that sort of stuff. That again, when somebody comes and buys the property, they know, oh, there was a problem with the roof, but it has been fixed. This is like, it helps this clarity. It helps people know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. Again, that's kind of the most key thing is you want people to know what they're buying. Even as a seller, you want them to know what they're buying. If there is something wrong with, um, let's say they have like, I know I had a client that had like a, a kind of like a closet that was under the stairs that was kind of low down that they had some stuff in or whatever. Maybe they only had some like decorations in or whatever. I remember when we were going through inspections, or not going through inspections, sorry, when they were going through the seller's disclosure, they mentioned the house flooded. And I said, did y'all get everything fixed? They said, yes, we put in there that it flooded. They had this, this repair place come in and fix it, blah, blah. But I put all that in there. That way, in case they came through an inspections and, went, and you know, the guy went in that, you know, lower closet or whatever and found that there was some stuff down there. Like, you know, there's some old, mildew or whatever kind of in that area. Well, we did mention that the house flooded. We had this company come in and fix it. Now it's no longer like the seller's fault. It's the seller had people come in and fix it. It kind of transfers to the company and it kind of just helps again, limit that liability of the seller. Um, also, you will get people who come in knowing what's, what's potentially wrong and what has been fixed in the house, as opposed to people coming in thinking the house is perfectly fine. They go into inspections and then backing out, which, you might think you want the house to look perfectly fine all the time. The problem with that is if you get, if you, if it looks perfectly fine, you will get people, you will client after client after client after client coming in, putting in offers, taking them out, putting in offers, taking them out, putting them offers, taking them out. Your house will be able to market for years and it'll never get sold. So the best thing to do is acknowledge what's wrong with the place or what's been fixed with it. Put that in the seller's disclosure. That way when people come buy it, they might know that okay, well, the, the foundation is pretty old, so there might be some stuff wrong with that. Hopefully not, but there might be. If they come in and find that something is slightly wrong with it, they expected that. That's why they're there. But they, they, they didn't think it was going to be perfect. And so, like, it, it looks better on both sides, and you'll actually get the deal done a lot faster. I have a question. Yes. Shocker. Uh, you said that the buyer always initiates by writing this. How yes. would they receive the notice or, of the seller's decision? That is a good question. So on our MLS, you can attach the documents to the property. So on the MLS, you can look up that there is, um, you know, this house has its conventions and bathrooms. There might, there's a section for like attachments and any attachments might be the seller's disclosure and stuff like that, which I've seen before, which is also very, very handy as a buyer's agent. Because if we go look at a house and there's already a seller's disclosure for that, 
one, I know that the deal is probably going to be a lot smoother because clearly both parties know what they're doing. Everything's being, everything's getting together a little easier. There's probably, we're probably not going to have any hiccups as far as like, oh, they didn't turn this in, they didn't do that. Because clearly they, they're going a step ahead by giving us this ahead of time. But also it's a lot nicer because I've had some very, very picky clients that you walk around and they go, how old was that roof? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like, I just, I just came here. The house, the house was built. I had a client ask that and the house was built in 2017. And I was like, probably when the house was built. If I had to guess, I bet the roof is from four years ago. I don't think they would have replaced it. Now. Like, it's, it's like, you'll have people that will ask questions that you just don't have an answer to. So as a seller's agent, it's probably a good idea to post it on the MLS. Yes. Okay. As a good idea to post on the MLS and as a buyer's agent, again, it's nice to have it. Because if I get those questions of how old BAC unit, I can look at the seller's disclosure and be like, oh, they replaced it in 2016 or you know whatever. So that's it's nice to have that stuff as well. Um, but that is a way you would have received the notice. I've also had it where uh, I go to a <coughs> showing. So I text the agent and say, hey, I'd like to set up a showing for Wednesday at noon. And they say, cool. Uh, let's say it's Sunday when I text them that. On Tuesday, they'll text me the seller's just like a link to the seller's disclosure into this and that. I don't email me this stuff for it. Again, that's just another way you can receive the notice ahead of time. That way, I again, I know what I'm getting into, but for them, it takes out this box two here, which is the buyer has not received the notice, and within blank days after the effective date of this contract, the seller shall deliver the notice to the buyer. If buyer does not receive the notice, the buyer may terminate this contract at any time prior to closing, and the earnest money will be restored to the buyer. If seller delivers the notice, buyer may terminate this contract for any reason within seven days after the buyer receives the notice or prior to closing, <coughs> whichever first occurs, and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. The reason that you don't want that box checked as a seller is that even if you have a three-day a three-day auction period, if you give them the uh, if you give them the seller's disclosure on day three, they have another seven days to back out for any reason. So, because what this is saying is that they have not received the notice and within blank days, they, they have to receive it. If they don't receive it within that time period, so if I don't receive it within five days, I can then, even if my, if I, let's say I put 15 days here and I don't receive it until day 15, I don't just have my 10 days, let's say, of auction period. I can, I can back out on day 14 because I still haven't received the notice. If you don't receive it at all, you can back out. You can walk into the title company to close and your buyer can just be like, I don't want it and just walk back out. And they're allowed to do that. <laughs> so um, that is a rough situation, but that is why as a seller's agent, you don't want this. You want to make sure they have this notice. Uh, I know Justin said he actually did a deal. They or not did a deal, but you can hypothetically think of if, if I was, let's say I'm sending aid in a contract. I can tell him that like, hey, I'm really interested in this property. I have a client really interested in this property. He wants it really bad. I know you're still kind of like putting everything up. You don't have a lot of stuff up there yet. We're not even going to do an option period. Zero option period. We don't, we don't even care to have an option period. Here you go. And he sends the contract over. Aiden's the seller's agent. He goes and tells his seller, like, this is really cool. Like, we, got a, we got a contract that doesn't even have an option period. So like, that's awesome for us because if they back out, we get the earnest money. Like, that's sweet. No option period for us. He gives it to his seller, they sign, send it back, we all accept, go through, whatever. But they don't realize that they never they never gave us a seller's disclosure. Well, at that point, even if they give it to us when it's signed, if they still have this box checked, they give it to us the day after it's signed, we still have seven days to back out. So we basically get an eight-day option period, even though we didn't have an option period. So that is why, as a seller, you never want this box checked. You always want box one checked. But as a buyer, this is super nice. <laughs> Are you good? Do you need me? Uh, I, get to my next slide. I think you're good. I think we're probably talking about leases later. So okay. I think we're good. All right. Do you need me? Oh, we'll do. Perfect. And then, yeah, box C or box three down here, the seller is not required to furnish the notice under the Texas property code. That is a situation that if, let's say, I've owned a house for 30 years or 40 years, but I don't live in it. It's just my vacation house or whatever. I probably don't have a seller's disclosure. I don't even know what's in the house. I don't know if it's a gas stove. I haven't really paid attention that much. Like at that point, you can argue that it's not required because you don't, the seller doesn't even know. Um, a lot of times, I haven't seen that happen. A lot of times when this is checked, I've had two deals that this has been checked on. It's for length. 
land does not require a seller's disclosure because there's nothing to disclose. There is no stove, to be gas, or whatever. It's just like, so there's no seller's disclosure that's necessary because there's nothing that go on it. There's no repairing of a roof. There's no AC unit. There's nothing like that to mention on a seller's disclosure. So a lot of times land will just have that it's not required by the Texas property code. Um, so yeah, that's the only situation that would come about that I know of. Section, or section C here, seller's disclosure of lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards is required by federal law for a residential dwelling constructed prior to 1978. That is, that will be on your test, that will be on your exam, like your real estate exam, is that it's required before 1978. They will ask you either what date is it required before, and it'll be January 1st, January 10th, February, whatever, January 1st. That is the date it is required before is January 1st, 1978. I think on my test they asked what year it was before, and it was 1978, 1979, 1976, and 1980. So they're not gonna throw out their 1978, 1957, 1990, whatever. Like they're gonna put a bunch of dates that are right next to each other and you need to know that it's prior to 1978. Did you have a test? Did you have a question like that on your yep. test? Okay, yeah. Everybody I've talked to has had that question on the test. <laughs> Literally everybody I've talked to. And the test is not a set test, it's randomized. There's like a bank of questions and they pull questions from this bank. Some of them they find more important. They will pull those all the time. I'm assuming this is one of them that will be on the test every single time. So, so that is very, very, very important. Yeah, so this is the HUD requires disclosure notice to be given to the buyer regarding lead-based paint along with a booklet called Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home. These are all things that you will find, especially like for us on zip forms, it's all like included in the contracts and everything like in our, we have like templates, so if you're getting a, a one to four family resale and you're buying it, you can just click on the template and it'll give you all the documents that you should have. If you're selling it, it'll give you all the documents you should be able to, that you should have to send over to people and whatnot. So this, but this is very, 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 very key. Um, I want to say, I don't know if it has it in here. Yes, another key thing on this uh, that is very, very interesting is that the lead-based paint addendum, it's actually an addendum that you will attach to the contract, um, addendum must be signed by all parties and both brokers in the transaction. As we talked about before, as an agent, you are a wing of your broker. You can sign things on behalf of your broker. That does not apply to this. That is how serious they think this is. If I'm selling a house that needs a lead-based paint addendum, I have to sign it. The, the buyers and sellers have to sign it along with Justin and whoever the buyer's agent broker is, not just the agents. Um, and that is one thing that comes up on uh, stuff like earnest money and stuff like that is that a lot of times when you're receiving a contract like for earnest or, or for option money, let's say, when it was back, like when we when we did it as a not title company, but we would have to do it, is like it would state that either I or my broker would have to do it, but technically Aiden could because he is an he's an associate of the brokerage or whatever, like he's technically a wing of Justin. This does not count for that. Justin has to sign it. My, my broker, Justin Nobles, has to sign this document. And same with the buyer's agent broker has to sign it. Um, that is the only situation where that is key. Honestly, I could do an entire transaction and never talk to Justin. Like, he wouldn't even know I'm doing a transaction. That's how like, much he doesn't have to, like, sign stuff and do. Uh, yeah, I kind of like, yeah, like read my notes, actually. <laughs> like I just have so much energy and then I'm not also trying to be like all like shaky in the chair and stuff either. Yeah. Right now. Are you sharing? Can everybody online hear me? Hear us? We can hear you, but you're not sharing your screen anymore. Okay, are we back? We have people apparently fixing the internet today, so hopefully that shouldn't happen, but it did. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's what the lead-based lead -based paint disclosure is about. 
or the addendum is about, sorry. Um, and also the brokers must maintain a copy of this addendum for three years. So if this is needed in any transaction, the broker has to keep a copy of this for three years. That is again, they're very serious about this. <laughs> so that is why it's so important. Um, both brokers, did you say? Yes, both okay. brokers. Both brokers have to keep a copy of this for three years. Um, I don't know if we talked about that last time, but again, we had, there was a, the reason this all came about is there was a kid who ended up passing away from eating paint off the wall. Um, eating just every time they went to, I think it was like the grandmother's house or whatever, which would paint off the walls. And the grandmother just thought she was, was weird. And then, but every time he went back to the parents, he was always sick. So the parents sued the grandmother for trying to poison their kid. And she's like, I'm not, let them not do anything. She didn't realize he was eating the paint off the walls. And then, yeah, he ended up passing away and it turned out it's because it was lead. And that's why he passed away. Also, lead tastes very, very sweet, which is why the kid kept doing it. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, but again, that's why this is, that's why they really, really harp on this is because of that. All right, now we're going to talk about the acceptance of the property condition. So as is means the present condition of the property with any and all defects and without warranty except for the warranties of title and the warranties in this contract. Buyer's agreement to accept the property as is under paragraph 7D does not preclude buyer from inspecting the property under paragraph 7a, negotiating repairs of treatments and a subsequent agreement or from terminating this contract during the auction period, if any. So what this is saying is that almost, I, I haven't done any yet where you check box two. I've always checked box one of just buyer will accept the property as is. Now that does give you the right to do an inspection and ask for repairs. So you still get the right to do an inspection and go, hey, uh, we noticed this electrical box is the door it's hanging off. We need somebody to fix that because that's a hazard. Or, hey, the back gate doesn't lock all the way. We have children. We'd like for somebody to fix that back gate for our children or whatever. You can still request stuff. That is not like that is not saying that like they just won't do anything. You are still allowed to request things like that in the contract. But what paragraph, what section two says is buyer accepts the property as is provided. Um, as is provided, seller at seller's expense shall complete the following specific repairs and treatments. Now, what you could put in here is, hey, we did a walk through the house. We noticed this, this, and this was wrong. I know Justin said he has done showings with people. There was a guy who was doing showings with that was constantly like, he'd bring a notebook and like write stuff down that he found wrong with the property. And there was a couple he went to <clears throat> that he, there was, I think he said about four or five closings one day. We got to the first property and it was him and this other guy. And he was like, Who's that guy? And he's like, oh, this is my inspector. I just had him come out to do like a pre-offer inspection of the house. And he's like, we don't have time to do a three-hour inspection. We're here for 15 minutes to look at the house. Like, what do you, no, I can't do that. And of course, the guy like paid for an inspector to come around and look at the house before they even put it in an offer. Now, again, you can put in here that we walked around the house and we noticed this and this and this and this were messed up. Please fix that before we even accept this contract. But that is what an option period is for. If you want to lose a contract, the best thing to do is like in this in this blank, just put see repairs and attached document or something like that. That will sh that that will I will look at that if I'm a seller's agent. I will look at that offer and I will just throw it away. <laughs> like I will I will go look at this and then throw it away. Because you haven't presented it, I will present it and then throw it away. <laughs> There's no reason to do that. Um, again, what you what what this could be used for is I have seen stuff where like. The children's bedroom that is painted bright pink. Can y'all please paint that a neutral white color? I've seen that or something of that nature where it's just like a simple little thing that like, hey, we just noticed this. We want to go ahead and offer this. Will y'all be able to do that? If not, we'll figure it out later. But like, this is something we'd like to offer and see if y'all can. Um, that is not like, that is not tremendously like expensive to do. So that's fine. But you don't want to throw in foundation, can y'all repair the foundation, get this fixed, repair the roof, we notice this thing's coming off the wall, do this, fix that. You will, again, they will look at that contract and they will just go, yeah, I'm not doing all that work, and put it away. <laughs> if the, if the, um, I guess, I'm trying to think now, if the inspection comes back and had all that stuff wrong with it, then you can offer that at that point. Hey, we did an inspection, we found that the foundation messed up, that the roof's coming off, all this stuff. Y'all fix that. If they say no, you can back out of the contract at that point. That's what that option period is for. Um, so again, this blank, it usually is blank. Um, but 
I have seen like slight cases of people putting stuff in here, but never anything extensive. Because again, if you want to lose a contract, that's kind of one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, yeah, another thing. Um, scroll down a little bit. So in E, it says lender required repairs and treatments. So unless otherwise agreed in writing, neither party is obligated to pay for a lender required repairs. Which include treatment for wood destroying insects. The parties then agree to pay for the lender required repairs or treatments. This contract will terminate and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. Now, I have seen it once where, and I say that like personally, I've seen it once, not so much, it's only ever happened once, but never attach a lender to an inspection report. If you're a seller, it's the most annoying thing possible. If you were, if you're, or if you're a buyer, if you're a buyer and you, if you're a buyer's agent and your buyer goes, you order an inspection, go do an inspection, the inspector will send a report to the buyer and to you to tell y'all, hey, here's what I found. This is the stuff that's wrong with the property. Usually at that point, you and the buyer will go through it together and kind of look at some stuff. Oh, there's foundation damage here. Ooh, that's a big one. That'd be kind of expensive to replace. What's this thing here? Oh, he says here that, you know, the siding on the walls coming off the outside, that actually, you could just nail that back up. It's not Whatever. You will kind of go through together and just kind of figure some stuff out. What I have seen once is that the buyer got that and sent that to me, the seller's agent, and the lender. If you're a lender, let's say why you were lending me $300,000 to buy a house. If you receive an inspection notice or an inspection report, you are actually required to review that document. You can't just throw it away. You actually are required to review it as, an, as a lender. But if you receive a document with an inspection report, and you are offering me or you're giving me three hundred thousand dollars to buy a house. What do you what do you want to be wrong with that house? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that much money. Yeah. So basically, what will happen is the lender will then go, okay, well, actually, I'm not giving you the money unless you fix this, 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 and this. That is how you lose funding really, really quickly. Is that? As a buyer, you send it to your lender. Your lender goes, oh, well, now that I have it, I've looked through it. Turns out this, this, and this are wrong. Well, then that buyer has to then ask the seller to fix it. And if the seller says no, the lender is going to go, well, then you're not getting my money. And the deal's open. So, yeah. <laughs> so the best thing to do would be ask, ask the seller to get to, to fix whatever you found wrong. If it's foundation, ask them to fix it. If they say no, probably going to back out at that point. If you have some siding that's like, Again, I think when my brother bought his house, it's a fairly old house. There were like two, like basically it's that tall wood planks on the side of the house. There are like two of them that have like slightly bent outwards just from warping over the years. You can just literally nail those back into place and they'll be good for another 15 years. There's nothing else to do with that. If there's something like that, the lender will require your repair because they want everything to be fixed. If the seller says no, in our case, if we ask for that and the seller said no, we just say, okay, we try and then we'll just buy, pay $5 for some deck screw or you know whatever like just like finishing screws and packing back in no big deal um but in this situation if the seller says no then the lender is not going to fund them the deal new. so you will lose your deal now so again just not a good idea just send this to the lender um another thing is that if you want to be an a-hole and you're going to back out of a contract you will send this to the other agent to the seller's agent because as a seller's agent, it is also our job that if we receive it, we have to go through it. And once we go through it, we are then notified about deficiencies in the house, and we then have to update our seller's disclosure to those deficiencies. I was doing a deal one time where we we had a client under contract, or we had a, I was selling a house. The buyer went through inspection. After inspection on day like four, whatever their option, they contacted me and said, hey, we'd like to terminate our contract. And I was like, oh, what, you know, is there any reason you'd like to terminate? Just curious. Um, didn't know if it was funding, you know, what? Is there any reason you'd like to terminate? And their response was, there's just more repairs than we need, than we wanted to take on at this time. Now, I, I was with myself, my sellers at the time, and they were like, we just repaired the house. Like, we just like refurnished everything like three years ago. Like, everything's brand new. Like, we did the wall, we did the floor, we've done everything. The roof, everything's brand new, like, as of three years ago. There's not anything wrong with this house. Well, you know what? Have them send that to me. No, you do not want that form. Well, there can't be anything wrong. I agree with that, but 
if their inspector missed something and thought the foundation was messed up, even though it wasn't, and you received that inspection report from an inspector, you then have to update your MLS and your seller's disclosure that says you have foundation issues. And then nobody's going to want your house. <laughs> so it's just best to leave it. Um, and that's a, they were like, well, what is there to take on? I bet they just wanted to back out because they just didn't want it. And I'm like, they, they're allowed to leave that. That's what the 10 days is for. They can back out for any reason. Like, that's not, that's not bad. Yeah, they can do that. That's okay. But you just don't want to be in that situation where you end up receiving it. Turns out there was foundation issues, you know, and if that was the case where they did redo the entire house, turns out there was something wrong with the foundation in the garage, let's say, or something like that. It's best just to leave that. Maybe the next people don't care if the garage has like whatever wrong with it. Or they'll go do inspections and the inspector doesn't even go in the garage or something because they hired a bad inspector. Cool. Like I don't it's it's fine. Like we were not notified of the problem. That's okay. Um whereas if they send it to us, we are then suddenly notified and we have to update all of our forms, which is again Justin has seen many times where if him and an agent, you know, if, if like the buyer's agent and the seller's agent don't get along. Well, then when the buyer's agent leaves, they go, we'd like to turn out a contract. Also, here's the, here's the inspection report, just so you have, just want to make sure you got that. That's not been being nice, that's them basically getting in the middle finger. <laughs> Suck it, we're out of here, basically is what they're doing. So that gets very, very. So you're saying that maybe the inspector messed something up and yes. said that there's foundation issues, even if there wasn't? Yes. So for the seller, could you get something done that proves that the foundation is fine, that you wouldn't have to put it on the seller's system? You could get another inspection, basically, and like... Cancel it out? Cancel it out in a way, but you still have to show... You have to... It, it's hard to argue at that point that like, no, no, my inspector was right and theirs was wrong. Yeah. You have to... You could go... There was foundation issues recorded by an inspector. We had another person come up look at it. There were no foundation issues. But you have to put that on the seller's okay. disclosure, which still might. It's not yeah. as good as just not having problems. So uh, yes, you can kind of fix it, but not to a point where like it's not a problem. Um, and again, one, inspectors are people, so people make mistakes. That's just what happens. But also, uh, there are opinions. So he might see a crack in a wall. You know, if there's a crack coming out of a door, he might see that and think foundation problems, whereas another inspector might see it and go, oh, that's probably settled and this house is from 1970. Like, you never know what people are going to think. So it's just, you have some, some inspectors, they are opinions. So you have some that will say other things than you. So that's all it is. Let's see. Yeah, and 7F, completion of repairs and treatments. Basically, the seller shall, shall complete all agreed repairs and treatments prior to the closing date. And all required permits must be obtained and repairs and treatments must be performed by persons who are licensed to revise and repair the treatments. Or if no license is required by law, all commercially engaged in a trade of providing such repairs and treatments at buyer's election. So what this is basically saying at buyer's election, yeah, yeah. So what this is basically saying is that we had a again, I had a house that after the inspection came back, they did find that a electric panel was kind of like one of the screws was loose that was hanging off the wall. And in the backyard, there was a gate that wouldn't close all the way. That was not a problem for them. They were just two adults who had kids that were in their like late teens. They don't care if the gate doesn't like close all the way. They're not, kids aren't gonna run into the street or whatever. They don't have any small dogs that are gonna get out, no big deal. Um, so for them, that wasn't a big deal. The thing in the garage, it was just a slight bolt that was loose. They didn't really care to fix it. Well, when the inspection came back that those things were a problem, because the inspector found those, and those are problems that the inspector will find, they asked if we could fix them. Well, he was like, yeah, I can go out and just bolt that in real quick. And I was like, I would, I would highly suggest hiring an electrician to do that. Because if you go do it yourself, and then in a year, it comes loose again and falls off, and something happens, the liability is on you for fixing it. Whereas if an electrician does it, something happens, the liability is on the electrician, not on you. So again, the, the gate in the back, they were he was like, I can go outside and fix it. And I was like, again, I would highly suggest hiring like a general contractor to go fix the gate. Because if you go try to fix it, you put a you, you kind of jankily put a lock on it where it's like locked technically, but whatever. And the kid runs out into the street and you know dies, gets hit by a car. I think one of those around the pool or whatever, it's like the kid falls in the pool and drowns. That comes back on you, not on a company that you had hired come out and fix the gate for you. So again, it just protects the liability in that situation. Um, and also, 
they're most likely going to know what they're doing a little bit better, even if you know how to fix a beat. That they're experts, and they, they, they're general contractors. They'll probably know what to do a little bit better. <laughs> so it's like, well, just easier to trust them. Uh, paragraph 7G advises the buyer to use an environmental addendum, uh, environmental system threatened or endangered species, and wetless, wetlands addendum if concerned about those matters. Um, so if you are worried about there being a threatened species or environmental problem with endangered species or habitat or something like that, there are addendums you can add to kind of either clarify that, that like this this is not a wetlands or whatever, um, or you use those in certain situations. If you know it is, you would also use stuff like that to clarify that those problems. Um, residential service contracts, go this one a little bit. Residential service contracts is just another fancy way of saying home warranty. Um, so a buyer may purchase a home warranty or residential service contract from a residential service company licensed by TRIP. If buyer purchases a residential service contract an amount not exceeding blank, buyer should review any residential service contract for the scope of coverage, exclusions, and limitations. The purchase of a residential service contract is optional, and similar coverage may be purchased from various companies authorized to do business in Texas. This, you will almost always see, you always want something here. Even if you're buying or selling, it doesn't matter. I think the average right now is six hundred, like six hundred dollars. I know, like last year was five ninety five. It changes every year. Like a couple years ago, it was seven hundred. Like it just it fluctuates back and forth. But basically, what's happening for this is the seller is going to reimburse the buyer a certain amount of money at closing to basically pay for a home warranty for a year. Now, as a buyer, that's really nice because if you move into a house and you move in and the stove explodes or the dishwasher just falls apart or something like that, you can call your home warranty company, pay $75 and they'll get you a new home. Super nice. Um, I know Linda said she has like, there have been appliances that cost a thousand dollars that she has got for 75 bucks because their home warranty was still in effect. And she just called the company, paid 75 bucks and they came and replaced her fridge or whatever. Like it's very, very nice in those situations. Um, as a seller, it's super nice because you get to you get to reduce the liability on your on your seller if for example the buyers move in and the day after they move in the stove explodes well clearly the seller should have known about that and that's something they didn't disclose they can sue you for non-disclosure all that deceptive trade practice all that sort of stuff so it's just easier to put in and again it's usually six hundred dollars if you're selling a house for three hundred thousand dollars six hundred bucks it's just easier to part way with and just deal with it then try to argue for that extra 600 bucks um but so again it's usually 600 and that just will cover the the buyer in that situation it also because what this does basically is it also when i say adds reduces the liability if you have this and move in the day after and your stove explodes by putting this in there the seller has basically owned up to that by paying you six hundred dollars for it so you can't sue them for non-disclosure because they did give you money in case something like that happened so that's what this is for um so that basically again covers the liability for the seller and also for the buyer it's super nice because if something does happen you don't have to worry about going through a whole lawsuit to get your money back to pay for whatever you you can just pay the 75 bucks and get a whole new appliance or whatever um, again, super, super useful. Okay, cool. And then, uh, let's see. Oh, that's a good point. So for this resident service contracts or the home warranties, um, a disclosure of relationship with a resident service contract form makes it clear that the money, basically the money transferred from a residential service contract company or a home warranty company to a broker must be for service provided and not as a referral fee. I know here in our office, we have little buyer like packets that we have that like our little folders that if we go, you know, we're showing a new buyer a house, we'll have this little packet for them that has some extra information about this and that or whatever. Um, but we have a little notices and stuff in there. And one of them we have is we have like a, I can't remember home warranty company. Um, but basically we have a home warranty company like pamphlet in there that will show like for this amount of money you can cover this much and do this and whatever we have little pamphlets for our home warranty company in there. now doing that 
we don't get a referral fee. It's not like that's that's you're not allowed. What this form basically does is it basically states that you're not allowed to. Every client I do a deal with, every client I have buy a house, I will send them to a specific home warranty company, and by only sending them to that one, that home warranty company will send me a hundred dollars every time I do that. You cannot do that. You cannot get a referral fee from other companies, but you can have services provided, such as if Justin was to buy flyers from a company, like he can technically pay for flyers or something like that, but you cannot, and you can also get services if they want to come in. If a company wanted to come in and do a uh, talk at one of our monthly meetings or whatever, he could pay for that or they could pay him to come in and do those talks or whatever, but you cannot get referral fees from people. That's basically all that that is going to stay. Okay, and then section eight, I know we all talk, already talked about this broker and sales agent disclosure, but the last thing we're gonna talk about today is the broker's fees real quick. And all of this section B, so again, section A is that disclosure. If you are related to somebody or related to a company that is, that is your client, in that situation, the principal in the transaction, you have to disclose it here. What section B is talking about is that all obligations of the parties for payment of the broker's fees are contained in a separate agreement. So even though later in the contract you will put up like, I will receive 3% from this transaction from commission and then a seller will give, the seller gets 6%, he gives 3% to the buyer, buyer's agent, sorry, seller's agent gets 3% or 6% gives 3% to the buyer's agent, both parties get 3%, that's how it works usually. Um, even though later in the contract you will state that you want 3%, there is an entire separate form that usually will state that um, they're, they're in separate written agreements that he will get this much and I will get this much. When a buyer or a seller's agent does a listing agreement, they will state how much, how, what the commission will be, which is 6%. So you will not see that a seller is going to get 6% commission in this contract. A seller will get 6% commission in the listing agreement. That is what that is saying is that basically how much they're getting paid, how much I'm getting paid is not in this contract, it's in a separate form. That's all this is saying. Um, and the reason they moved this, again, this sales agent disclosure used to be paragraph four, they moved it down to eight because all paragraph eight was was just this one line of a fee. So they kind of added that together. Um, can you pull up the other contract? I kind of wanted to show you all something real quick. So this is a form we got that is, what the old contract was, everything in red they crossed out, everything in blue they added. So if you just keep scrolling, this whole paragraph four right here, this used to be the license holder disclosure, which is what was in paragraph eight. It is now about leases. So it's about residential fixed leases, natural resource leases, stuff like that on the property for the seller. Um, we will go over this separately later. I know it's kind of weird to be in paragraphs one, two, three, and then five, six, seven, eight, we kind of skipped four. Um, that is because four used to be this license holder disclosure. I will have Justin come in and talk about leases because to be fair, we just went over this training. Justin's been doing this for a lot longer. We just learned about all this, this sort of stuff because it's brand new fairly recently. So I will have Justin come in and talk about more specifically what these leases are and what they do and all that sort of stuff um, in a later class. Just to just letting you know, I we will get back to this if you're looking at the contract and realizing we skipped a section, we will get back to that. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, and you just keep scrolling. You can find this too. I just looked up truck contract changes, went to the first link and then found where it says 2015, 20-15 and click on that. This will show you all the things that are different. Um, so if you saw there on, on paragraph five, that's where the earnest money and option money are now together as opposed to it just being earnest money. Now it's both, all that sort of stuff. All of the changes are in here. If you're wondering why this class is confusing to me, because of this. <laughs> if you wonder why I'm struggling on figuring out what I'm supposed to say or where I'm supposed to be going, it's because so many things have changed in this. And this is just the one to four family. All the other contracts have changed the exact same way. So this is why this whole thing is getting confusing to me is because I'm trying to figure out what's still the case and what's not the case anymore. So just to explain that. But yeah, so that is going to be it for today. Um, I know y'all have your test coming up right after this. Does anybody have any questions before Y'all get into your class or get into your test. <laughs>